Hello everybody and welcome back. So here we are now into our second exercise uh, where we are looking at how to test for equality across multiple population proportions. So I will assume you've watched the first couple of videos here and you have a fairly good understanding of the methodological approach that is used here. So basically what we're doing, everything that we've done is based on the assumption that the null hypothesis is true and that assumption is embedded in all of our calculations. So what we end up doing here, when we're looking at these proportions, is we say, okay, here's what we observed. If the null is true, here's what we would expect to observe. And we compare those numbers. And if the difference between what we observe and what we expect to observe is very large, well then that tells us that what we expected, because that expectation is, is based on the null being true, that difference is being very large, well then that tells us that well maybe the null is not true, because what we observed is very different from what we might have expected. If that difference is very small, and what we observe is very similar to what we would expect if the null is true, well then that supports the null. So let's get into this after the most recent election. You decided to determine if there was a difference in the proportion of voters who changed their voting intentions at the last minute. So some voters choose early on in the campaign who they will vote for and they stick with it. Others might change their mind as new information become available. This might shed some light on which voters are more susceptible to information that is released close to election day because they might be more likely to change their minds. In order to gather this data, you produce a survey that asks each respondent which party they voted for and if this was a result of a change in their intentions within four weeks prior to the election day. So here are our observed frequencies. So what we can see here is that I, I surveyed 194 people who voted for the Conservative Party. 96 of them changed who they were going to vote for in the four weeks prior. So maybe before that they were going to vote for Liberals or somebody else. But within four weeks up to the election, they changed and decided to vote Conservative. 98 of those people, nope, they were always going to vote Conservative. They did not change their mind. And then same kind of thinking for the 161 liberals and the 136 who voted for other. Now, so what, is, what does this test look like? Because of course our first, our first task is to formulate our test. So we have our null and our alternative hypotheses. And so here again, the, the formulation of these tests are relatively straightforward, although yes, there's one area where it's easy to make a mistake. But unlike much, many of the other tests that we've done in module 9, 10, 11, where we had to think about is this an upper tail test, a two tail test, a lower tail test, we don't have to think about that anymore because those options no longer exist. All of the tests that we're looking at when we have multiple proportions are testing to see whether or not they are the same. So we have the proportion of those who voted for conservatives equal to the proportion of those who voted liberal equal to the proportion of those who voted for some other party. So we have a test for equality in the null. So the one area where of course uh, I often see mistakes often because you're in a routine you're kind of you're doing this habitually maybe you're not thinking maybe you're in an exam and you're stressed and you're under a lot of pressure and you might write this like this and you put those inequalities. Certainly that's a possible outcome, but that is not what we're testing for yet. What we are testing for at this point is simply to determine whether or not there's at least one that is different, at least one of those three proportions is different, or you could simply say not all are equal. So to say not all of them are equal implies at least one of them is different. And we're going to do this test at the 0.1 or the 10% level of significance as given here. 
So there's our null and alternative hypotheses. Now, when we do this test, we assume that the null is true, as we've done with every other test, which implies then that there exists some common population proportion because of the proportion of conservatives is equal to that of liberals, is equal to that of other. Well, then I can do away with that subscript. So when I write this other P, I'm not adding a fourth. I'm just saying that if they're all the same, I don't need the subscript. There's some common population proportion here. In this case, some common population of proportion of voters who said yes, and some common population proportion of voters who said no. In other words, it doesn't matter who you voted for. The proportion is the same. So we need our best point estimate of that unknown proportion. So when I look across the yes row, here I can see that 265 out of the 491 surveyed said yes. So ignoring political affiliation, here I can see that 265 divided by 491, so if I divide that by 491, well, this says that 0 0.54, 54% of those surveyed said yes. So I'm ignoring political affiliation, which is consistent with the assumption that the null is true, that it doesn't make a difference. 54% said yes, which means, and then again, if I calculate the, the no answers, 226 over 491, or really 1 minus 0 0.54, that would give us the same answer, 0.46. So 54% of respondents said yes. I did change my voting intention within the last four weeks. 46% said no. So those are what we would expect the proportions to be if the null is true, which means it doesn't matter if you voted conservative, liberal, or other. That is what we would expect that proportion to be. So we apply that proportion to our various samples. So here I sampled 194 conservatives. I would expect that out of those 194, I would expect 54% of them would have said yes. So 0 0.54 times 194, I would expect 104 point, this is pretty small, 104.76 to have said yes. Again, I'm just applying that proportion, that is the proportion of all respondents who said yes, I'm applying that proportion to each of our different categories. Same thing for the liberals, 0 0.54 times 161, so I would have expected 86 0.94 to have said yes, and now applying that proportion, 136 times 0.54, well here I would have expected 73.44. So again, I'm taking that proportion, that 54%, and I'm saying it doesn't matter, regardless of political affiliation, if the null hypothesis is true, it doesn't make a difference. So I'm taking that proportion and I'm applying it to all of those groups treating them all as if, as if they're the same. And we do the same on the no side. So out of the 194, I would expect, now I'm going to take 46%. So I'm going to times that by 0.46, and I have 89.24. And that would be the same as if I took this 194, and out of the 194, well, I would have expected 104.76 to have said yes. And if I calculate 194 minus 104.76, well, wouldn't you know it? I get the same answer if I calculate it this way as I would multiplying it by 0.46. So you can calculate it whichever way is easiest for you.
the next one of the liberals, 161 times 0.46. And here I would expect 74.06 to have said no. And 0.46 times 136 for the other, 62.56. So now we have our expected frequencies. Now we need to calculate our the rest of our test statistic. Again, because this is a chi-squared test, an upper tail chi-squared test, where we are looking at those differences between what we observe and what we expect to observe. If what we observe is very similar to what we expect, and again, remember those expectations are based on whether, on the null hypotheses being true. So here's what I expect, what I would expect to see if the null is true. If what I actually observe is very similar to what I expect, well then those differences will be small. And if those differences are small, the test statistic will be small. If those differences are large, in other words, what we expect to see is very different. Let me correct myself. If what we actually see, our observed frequency, is very different from what we would expect to see, and those differences are large, when we square them, of course, they're very large. That makes our test statistic large, which is why this is an upper tail test because that test statistic is only going to be large. It's only going to lie in the upper tail of that distribution if these differences are large. And those differences are only large if our null hypothesis is false. So we calculate this in steps. First, I've got my expected values. Now I'm going to calculate those differences. So what I observed minus what I expect then I'm going to square those differences. Then I'm going to divide those squared differences by that expected value. And then somewhere down here, we'll add all of these values up, right? We're applying those summations and then that is where we will have our chi-squared test statistic. So this is a little bit tedious. I won't be offended if people want to fast forward through this part, but you can also watch it step by step if you like. So the first part, that observed frequency. So again, I'm going to start here in the yes row, then we'll just go across the yeses and then the noes. And I'm not going to write out every single step. I'll write out a couple and then we'll just go from there. So here, for the yes, for the conservatives, I see I observed 96. I expect 104.76. So 96 minus 104.76. That gives me negative 876. Then I square that. I have 76.74. Then I divide that by that expected value 104.76 and that gives me 0.73 let's round it let's go to three decimals 733 okay and then I'll, I'll do the next one here i have 82 minus and i'm right here 82 minus 86.94 minus 4.94 squared and divided by 86.94 and on we go okay so now I'm into other 87 minus 73.44 squared divided by 86.94 nope not 
183.87 divided by 73.44. That gives me 2.5. That's better. Okay. Now I go into the no row, and it's exactly the same calculations. So again, 98 minus that expected, and 89.24. And we definitely see that same relationship. Right here I can see, now I'm in the no column, and I get familiar numbers. So you can use this as a shortcut. You can also use this as a way to double check, because you should definitely always see this relationship. So of course when I square that, well, I'm going to get exactly that same value. But the next column is not going to be the same, because that expected value that I'm dividing by, right, to get this number... Right, that was 76.74 divided by that 104. Now, I'm taking that 76.74, the expected value is different. It's now 89. So here, I divide that by 89.24, and so that gives me 0.86. Okay, so again, plenty of room to make silly mistakes and frustrating mistakes. Next one, I'm into the middle, 79 minus 7406, 494, squared, everything's checking out, I'm getting the same values, and now I'm going to divide this by the expected value there, was 74.06, 0.96, and the very last one, I'm just going to have to clear this out. The last one for the other, 49 minus 62.56. 13.56 squared, 183.87 divided by that expected value, 62.56. And I have 2.939. Now we can add all of these up to get our chi squared. So plus 32.32 plus 0.86. I'm just adding vertically. Plus 2.5 plus 0.281 plus 0.733. And here I have my chi-squared of 7.63. Yes, one of the more tedious test statistics to calculate, but we got there. What distribution are we using? Degrees of freedom here is k minus, whoops, k minus 1. How many categories do we have? I have one, two, three categories. Degrees of freedom is two. Now I want to just point something out. The first exercise in this module, I had three categories. This one I have three categories. The next one, I also have three categories. I want to make it clear that this is not limited to just three categories. We can do four, five, 10, 20 categories if we want. Imagine these calculations if I had 5, 10, 20 categories. It just becomes much more time consuming and much more tedious. So I just don't do big, long problems like that. But you need to make sure that this method works. This is the method that you would use if you had more than, uh, well, three or more different categories. I'm only using three here just for simplicity, okay? So I have two degrees of freedom. We're doing a 10% level of significance. So I'm going to come down to my chi-squared, and here I can see two degrees of freedom, 10% level of significance. So here I have this critical value of 4.6. So here's this chi-squared distribution. Critical value is 4.605. That gives me an area in that upper tail of 0.10, and that defines that rejection space, right? And do not reject. 
it's an upper tail test, right? Because if those differences between what we observe and what we expect to see if the null is true, if those differences are large, that chi-squared statistic is going to be large and it's going to lie in the upper tail of that distribution. Our test statistic here was 7.6. So we're kind of in between these two values, right? Our test statistic was up here somewhere. at 7.6. So what does that tell us? Our p-value, the area in the upper tail, is between 0.025 and 0.01. So coming back up here, our p-value is less than 0.025, greater than 0.01. And certainly looking at that critical value approach, it's, it's also larger than that critical value. And that corresponds with an area of 0.1. So it comes as no surprise that our p-value is also less than that significance level. So what do we find? Both of these approaches, as always, give us the same conclusion. We do have evidence here to reject the null hypotheses. We have evidence to show that not all of these proportions are equal, meaning at least one group, either those who support the conservatives, the liberals, or others, the proportion of voters who change their voting intentions within four weeks is different for at least one of those different groups, one of those different political affiliations. Which means that it is appropriate to use the Marisquillo procedure to find where the difference exists. We've gone through this exercise. We have determined that, yes, there is a difference. Now we want to know which one or which ones are different. So I'll do a second video because these videos get long because of tedious calculations. We'll go through a second video to determine where the difference lies or which one of these proportions is different. Okay, thanks for watching guys. I hope that was helpful.